TV, and today we're going to be talking to Jeff Steinborn, the Washington State attorney, who has some rather valuable observations to make about the new law in Washington State, I-502. You said that I-502 is a sting operation in progress. Please explain. I-502 is a sting operation in plain sight because most of its provisions require that you register somewhere and tell the government exactly what you're doing. And exactly what you're doing is a clear violation of federal law. And every document you file to comply with 502 can become an exhibit in a federal prosecution against you. All that stops at is the discretion and forbearance of the feds. And their statements about what they're going to do have been so ambiguous that I think anybody who relies on the assurance that they won't be prosecuted federally is foolish, just plain foolish. So you sign up, you tell them you're growing pot. They are the, the I-502 itself requires the state to turn over all the information that you give them to any federal law enforcement agency that inquires. It's a requirement of the statute. So that's what I call a sting. Come on in, sign up. We won't prosecute you, but we're going to give this to the feds who may or may not prosecute you. And they may or may not take all your property. They may or may not give you a five-year mandatory minimum because you had over 100 plants. They may or may not give you a five-year mandatory minimum because you had a firearm in your possession while you're growing your legal pot or selling your legal pot. If you're trying for a license under 502 and you want to run a business where you got employees, when you get to four employees, you become a, uh, a continuing criminal enterprise. It's a RICO offense. It starts at a mandatory 15 years in prison. Will the feds do that? I don't know. Should I advise a client to put his name on a piece of paper that says I got four employees and I'm growing pot? I'm not going to do that, knowing the risk. We don't know whether the feds are going to leave, leave you alone or not. So that's why I call it a sting in plain sight. It was obvious that the self-incrimination aspects of it were obvious. No one made any apologies for it. They just said, well, it's still legal under federal law. Maybe they won't bother you. That's the best they can tell us. Now the feds have said, well, you know, we probably we might not bother you, but, it, you know, we still reserve the right to do it if we want to. That's no promise when you're looking at losing all your property and maybe doing 10 or 15 years in prison, how much are you ready to risk? But you can go downtown and you can spend 7500 bucks on a lawyer who will set you up with all these documents. Boy, set you up is what they're doing. Will the taxation requirements be what voters expected? I don't think the voters realize just what this tax structure means. If you've got to add 25% at every level, it comes out to, I think, 92% if you compound the interest or something like that. And that's before sales tax. And that's before income tax. What should people know about the licensing system? The licensing system is, they've regulated cannabis as though it were plutonium or anthrax or something really deadly. Way over-regulated. You know, you don't, you don't see uh, any, any other substance regulated like this. Even alcohol and tobacco aren't regulated that carefully. 
nor are they taxed that extensively. You can get a license to be a producer and a processor. You can have, you can integrate those two levels. The producer is a grower. The processor takes the, the grown pod and packages it for sale to the retail store. You can integrate those two functions, producer and processor. The retailer has to be totally separate. Everybody who wants a license and their spouse has to pass a background check. No money can come in from out of state. No players can come in from out of state. Uh, criminal records probably disqualify you. And the, the hoops you have to jump through to make this work are probably going to be economically prohibitive. When It's not clear yet whether all the security and tracking that you have to do is going to be beyond the, you know, the financial abilities of many people. But certainly, it's going to weed out a lot of the smaller businesses and we're going to end up with big money involved. How will I-502 impact the Washington state economy? The person that could answer that question, the question of how 502 is going to impact the economy of Washington, that person, uh, I'd like to talk to that person because it's not clear. My own feeling is that in the immediate future, it's not going to impact the economy at all because it's not going to work. It's not going to generate enough revenue to be a significant influence. Sooner or later, the people want legal cannabis. Big money wants to be able to sell legal cannabis. So this train's going to roll down the tracks and it's going to reach the station sooner or later. Will it generate income for the, for, uh, the state? If they are successful in wiping out the underground market, it might. Although I'm just not sure how many folks there are who are ready to go pay that kind of prices for pot. They might just stop using it, which is what prohibition's all about, I guess, huh? So in the immediate future, I don't see any significant impact. Uh, at some point, it, in, under a good scheme of distribution, it should become a significant uh, source of income for the state, of tax revenue. But, you know, when a pig becomes a hog, it gets sla slaughtered. And I think this bill is hoggish. It's, they want way too much tax money from people who would just as soon grow their own or buy it on the black market. You think you can wipe out that black market? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. One of the biggest industries in the state is selling grow lights. Seeds have proliferated for the last decade or more since the Canadians started selling seeds. This genie is out of the bottle. It's not going back in. The only question is how many lives are going to be destroyed by law enforcement in their vain attempt to enforce prohibition once again. What should people expect once I-502 is implemented? Well, be prepared to pay a lot of money for your pot. Be prepared, I think, to take a, uh, to get used to pot that's not as good as what you're used to now. Uh, be prepared to start taking taxis and buses rather than driving. And uh, don't expect to be employed because there's nothing slowing the employer's uh, power to drug test you and to throw you off a job if you test positive for pot, whether you're using it on the job or not. So, again, you know, pot is going to be free, uh, available to the very rich who don't have to piss into bottles and can afford to pay three, four hundred bucks an ounce, can afford to take taxis or maybe think they won't be bothered because they're driving fancy cars. And the rest of us uh, will have to choose between pot and employment, have to choose between pot and driving, Thank you for joining us, and thank you, Attorney Jeff Steinborn, for taking the time to explain these important issues. This has been Steve Cubby. You can catch our show at CubbyTV.com, PotTV.com, CannabisCulture.com, and other premium cannabis websites. In the meantime, take care and have a great 420 day. It's the proximity.